Good evening and welcome to this virtual by the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Knowledge Foundation in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program, bringing to you seventh edition of Knowledge Summit with the theme, Knowledge, Protecting Humanity and the Planet in the Pandemics. I am Sally Saeed, TV anchor at Summit Dubai TV, and I'm honored to represent Dubai Media Incorporated on such a prestigious event. I'm happy to welcome all those who are joining us online in this virtual conference entitled Coexistence and Synergies in the Marine Space. Let me start by welcoming our honorable guest, Dr. Habiba Marashi, co-founder and chairperson of Environment, Emirates Environmental Group. Since 1991, uh, Dr. Habiba Marashi has been actively associated in leadership roles in global bodies such as the UN Global Compact and president of the UNGC, the GCC states, UNEP civil society representative, a member of Global Reporting Initiative Stakeholder Council, and a member of the advisory committee of the DNB Certification Advisory Board for the Middle East. She is currently a vice chair of the Global Urban Development and Patronage Committee member of My Climate. She is a woman who dedicated herself to, def to defending the environment. And on a different note, Personally, Dr. Habiba was a role model to me while growing up as a student. I was privileged to be awarded a couple of times by her. And to me today marks a very sentimental uh, value filled with pride and gratitude. Let me introduce Mr. Habiba Marashi. Welcome and the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sally, for that very kind uh, uh, introduction. It's a pleasure for me to join uh, the Knowledge Summit and I thank Muhammad for to the Knowledge Foundation for giving me this platform. Uh, this is not the first time I share, I joined them and uh, I had the privilege of participating physically with them in, in previous years. And I look forward, inshallah, to continue collaboration with the center. The, the, the pride is ours and we are honored to have you here on this platform today. Uh, you can uh, proceed with the presentation that you have uh, for us today. Thank you. Um, First, I would really like to thank uh, the organizers. This is a very uh, beautiful and timely uh, subject. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, environmental issues, about energy conservation, about climate change, about waste, but somehow the marine environment is, uh, is overlooked and you know, is not really focused on, you do not have all the stakeholders understanding this issue and putting a lot of effort. So I'm, I'm happy that this is, uh, one, this is one of the topics that uh, we are tackling today. So what is, you know, really um, ocean literacy? And that is a knowledge, that's a science. You know, how can we build on uh, and create, as we say, we are creating corporate citizenship. How do we create um, um, ocean citizenship? How do we get people to understand these issues, to appreciate it? Then they will learn how to nurture it and protect it. So in the last two years, we have the whole world is talking about pandemic. We, a lot of people have suffered. Uh, uh, countries, economies were brought to a standstill. There was a lot of issues and it manifested itself in the humanitarian side, in the economic side, in every side. But actually, in reality, we have a lot of other issues that we are facing on a daily basis. And uh, these are all um, as a result of our own activities as human beings, so the anthropogenic uh, uh, effect has led to many uh, crises and to many issues. You know, we are we are witnessing global warming, mass extinctions of animals, and you have many international bodies bringing out the list and and warning and and uh, raising the alarm at the speed that we are losing uh, species. The extreme weather patterns that we are witnessing around the globe, which results again in economic crises in in late. Um, delivery of certain products, uh, which then affects uh, food security and food uh, sovereignty in, in other parts of the world as well. We are looking at overpopulation, um, and the world is already, you know, uh, projected to be uh, more than nine billion by uh, 2030. Um, but the size of the planet has not changed, and the resources actually are dwindling. We have the different types of pollution air pollution, water pollution, which comes from all our waterways, the water surface on the planet. 
the melting of ice caps and the, uh, this is one of the most important issues is the ocean acidification, which then really renders the ocean just body of water, but lifeless doesn't have anything to do. So if we understand the concept that we are literally living on borrowed resources that we have, we are taking from the future generation, then maybe that will arouse our attention and we will be looking at how can we work together to ensure that we are tackling this issue and these challenges. And as the Secretary General of the UN said that, you know, let this be the decade of action from 2021 till 2030. We are supposed to really come up because we know now all the, all the problems that are out there, we know it. And actually, the solutions are there as well. We just need now to bring those that knowledge into action. So this is where I would like to emphasize again, what are the oceans? What is the importance of uh, oceans? Look at, at, uh, look at this um, design that you know, I would like to share with you. Now, today, uh, many people do not know the importance of ocean on life on land and how it affects us. So if you are looking at um, the, the, the water surface of the planet, um, it is really very important for us to understand that system and to understand the impact that it has got on land. And when you look at uh, phytoplanktons that are there and they're responsible, so the marine life, the microorganisms that are there, they are really responsible for 50% of breathable oxygen that we need as human species. The, the water helps, the water bodies on the planet help to regulate really the temperatures because they absorb more than 90% of, of the sun rays and it makes this planet livable and comfortable. Again, one of the most important issues that we all know about is the food. The, the oceans are rich in, in uh, marine life, in biodiversity, and they are important sources of food, not for us only as human beings, for other uh, species as well. So understanding the importance of these bodies of water and the water surface on the planet is really uh, part of the uh, solution as well. To continue building on Okay, so why am I not moving? Okay, so continue building on the importance of ocean literacy, this, this knowledge that is not really out there. You do not see it all the time in the, in the media, whether it is written media or heard media or, or seen media. We don't see many documentaries. There was, of course, the famous uh, professor that used to give us, but that was quite a few years ago. Nowadays, we do not see much of that and we do not have many documentaries for our region, uh, for our youth to understand and to benefit. According to science, we have not discovered two thirds yet of marine life. It's really a very untapped uh, part. Uh, and there's a lot of wealth that we do not know about it. And there is a lot of still discovery areas that are not explored, more than 80%. And it's till now, it's beyond our ability to comprehend and to understand what is there. So the need of intense research, the need to build the knowledge on our oceans, the need to create these bodies on different levels, whether it's on a societal level, on a national level, on regional levels, collaboration and cooperation between different countries. As always, the body of water is not uh, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, property of one country. It is always shared, like we have our Gulf water, you know. That waterway is shared by so many countries in the region. And to understand that knowledge and to, to do the research re needs uh, and requires collaborated effort between all the players, whether we are talking about research institutions, we are talking about international bodies, UN bodies, you are talking about governments, you are talking about the local knowledge, you know, the, the uh, fishermen, uh, the, the, in, the, in the old days, we call them you know, the uh, vessel owners who used to travel and know these 
uh, the paths and everything. So they know they used to understand the seasons and they used to act according to the season. And that was local knowledge that was inherited uh, from uh, grandfathers to fathers to sons. Do we have those information? According to the uh, research of UN National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, it says that more than 90% of Earth's warming in the last 50 years has happened in the oceans. So there's a lot of unfortunate uh, impact of uh, global warming on the ocean that has not come to the attention of the laymen or to uh, the general masses. So it has not raised the alarm, nor it has called for urgent uh, actions. And this is something that is important that we need to know more about it. If you look at the impact of ocean literacy on our life as human beings and, and how this knowledge will help us really um, uh, do more. If we know that this action is having a positive impact, then you know we have the knowledge for it, then we will still work on it. And we know something that we are doing is not correct, then we will be looking at understanding this action is not correct, we need to stop it, we need to put uh, laws, regulations, legislation that can prevent the wrong uh, doing and wrong, wrong behavior. What kind of changes in our lifestyles that we need to? How do we encourage open literacy and open and social citizenship amongst our uh, people, amongst the different uh, levels? How does it become a part and parcel of our knowledge and capacity building exercises? For example, you know, not many people uh, understand the impact of plastic pollution that we have here on the ground, they understand it on the ground, but they have never understood that impact on the oceans. And when we do clean up UAE, for example, and we target coastal areas in different Emirates, it is amazing and it is frightening really the amount of waste, plastic waste that is washed ashore by the waves and where is that coming from? So it may have been traveling thousands of miles from a different part of the world, but because there are so many sharing of, of the waterways and it's an open passage, so they come. And the vessels that keep on you know, thinking that this is a bottomless pit and they keep on throwing all the ships and all the uh, tankers and all the vessels, they keep on throwing. So where do these things enter? End up with. So either they end up on our shores and create a lot of Un, you know, um, unsightly uh, places and um, not uh, fit for human um, um, use, unfortunately, and it becomes like waste dumps as well. This is very important because when you are throwing the plastic, it's not that you know it's, you are creating uh, pollution. And and we have heard of the plastic islands, and I will go into that in detail. But what we are not understanding is within that plastic pollution, there's the microplastics. The microplastic research today shows that it has really invaded all the seas and all the oceans and all the waterways, and it has gone to the furthest corners of the world. So they did a lot of research and they checked uh, different species of fish in the deepest seas. And they found that the level of my of uh, plastic, uh, microplastic uh, pollution in the in these uh, uh, species and in these fish sometimes reaches to 60%. And that is a very, of course, dangerous level. And where do these, uh, where does that food uh, end, uh, end? It ends on our tables, on our plates, and it goes into our system. So we are literally shooting ourselves on the foot. On one side, we do not understand what we are doing, but it goes a full circle and it comes back to hit us and uh, to damage the health and it causes a lot of uh, financial as well. So understanding all these challenges, the United Nations in 2015, and of course there was a lot of work before that for, for three years to develop this set of goals that they call them the Sustainable Development Goals. And they rolled them out in 2015 as a, as a, what, as a continuation of the Millennium Development Goals, which were already rolled out in 2000. Having not achieved the Millennium Development Goals, which were eight only, there was a bigger, a participatory process, more governments came on board, more international bodies, NGOs, academia, came together to develop the 17 uh, goals that cover every aspect of life. So one of these goals really is goal number 14, which is uh, addresses the issue of 
life below water and everything that is related with uh, uh, marine life. And this is an important issue that we should understand and uh, we should be having the right um, um, to you know, work on it, uh, the streams that we want to go into it and the partnership that we want to build for it. Um, so that we will be able to understand the problems that are there and we will be able to find solutions, sharing the solutions, um, learning from best practices, talking about the challenges that are out, uh, out there and how can we work together. Okay, so then working with the uh, Marine and talking about it brought um, another issue to the forefront. And this was literally brought out in the in the recent uh, history, and it's not that it was it took years and years. You know, it's just been um, developed and it has just uh, been rolled out uh, there. So, what does it say? You know, as per the World and and uh, Food Organization, which is called FAO, over 3.5 billion of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the ocean or sea or any waterway, and they are around more than 150 coastal and island nations. So this number of uh, small islands that all share waterways brought the terminology into small island developing states that they are known and there's, there was more sensitivity, more appreciation and more understanding. You and body started uh, addressing these issues and looking at what are the vulnerabilities of these islands, particularly with regards to climate change. Okay, and then they started looking and starting to quantify to see how um, um, the ocean is contributing to life on land. And ac according to the global economic uh, activity, it is estimated to be three to five trillion US dollars. So it's not a small uh, amount. And these are important issues that we need to understand. When we look at transportation of all the goods, you know, 90% of global trade still uses waterways. You know, marine transport is the most effective mode and it is the most cost effective and, uh, you know, um, best way, safest way. Uh, instead of uh, flying aeroplane, it's very expensive, very environmentally dangerous as well. Um, so this is, again, it has not changed and it will not change. Again, when you look at the uh, oil business, you know, the, the amount of uh, oil that is being drilled from offshore and bringing is, a, is more than 30% globally. Uh, so these are all important issues that we need to understand, the humanitarian, uh, the social, the environmental, the economic angles to the importance of uh, water uh, covers uh, on the planet. So in the last 20 years, this issue is coming more and more to the forefront. United Nations is creating uh, this new sense of responsibility. There are different uh, committees that are looking at this issue and how, and there is more voice. You can hear more voice now about uh, tackling these uh, issues. So you bring, which brought about the topic of blue economy that we want to focus on. This was first coined in the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, which started really in 1972, and then it was in 1992, then it was 2012. So we are, it continues. So it became really a proper terminology developed and proper actions, and it was put and coined, and it became a part and parcel. What does Blue Economy focus on? To develop approaches that can sustainably use marine resources? How do we mitigate the looming dangers that are there and the challenges? How do we make these islands safer and more secure? Because as you can see from the data over here, you can see how, um, uh, how they are positioned and how um, uh, vulnerable they are really uh, to deal with this uh, challenge. And uh, I think this is very important as well for us to understand so that we can um, learn how to protect and preserve it. This is part of the um, uh, ocean literacy. How do we adopt? How do we adopt the blue economy and who should adopt it? 
And how do we build? How do we inculcate it and bring it, you know, to be part of our curricula, particularly at the university level? Why shouldn't we have specialization in marine environments, marine engineering? Why this issue is still um, sidelined? You know, it really has not been mainstreamed until now, particularly for coastal areas like the UAE that we have got thousands of kilometers of uh, coastal area. I think this is something very important. So in, in 2014, as part of Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, as you all know, in the month of January, there was the Abu Dhabi Declaration. And the Abu Dhabi Declaration very clearly talked about blue economy as a tool for island and coastal state to transition towards sustainable development. And there were many presidents, I remember I attended this meeting, there were many presidents from different islands that had come, Maldives and the others, to really talk about the challenges and how they are seeing the impact of climate change on their country. Um, uh, you have Bangladesh, for example, low-lying uh, coastal areas, and what they are facing, challenges that they are facing to the very survival of these countries. And research does not uh, draw a line a good uh, picture. It's a very negative and gloomy picture unless we jump in as human beings and correct our action before we reach uh, the tipping the tipping point. So then this was embraced as part of the uh, blue economy. And as you can see, the areas that it covers, uh, beautiful um, covering all aspects of it and ensuring that each part of it really can be turned into full modules to be taught into universities and to help build. It doesn't need to be um, um, a mandatory. They can be elective. They can be, um, uh, you know, so that they are, we arouse the interest of the future generation to understand these issues and to learn about them. I always like to focus on the role of the financial sector in everything. Uh, because you will usually see that the financial sector feels that it is excluded, that it does not have a direct role to play, uh, that it is not part of the environmental disasters, that's not much that can be done, and that is furthest from reality and from the truth. So how do we get the financial institutions really um, to come on board and be part of the solution and to help achieve uh, the sustainable development goals and to ensure protection of uh, marine systems. There's a lot of research, um, for example, coral reef regeneration. And as UAE, quite a few uh, you know, prototypes have been done. Good results have come out of it. And now it's been done on a massive scale. So if we have reached to a good um, uh, growth in there and good progress, this is a best practice that should, in, that should attract investment that we should share this knowledge and best practice with our neighboring countries and to the other regions as well. Mangroves that, you know, a lot of people do not know the importance of mangroves. And we are blessed, alhamdulillah, in the UAE to have beautiful uh, spots of mangroves in, in many parts of the country. What is it? What requires to protect these mangroves um, and to continue uh, so that they continue serving the role that they are serving. Today, mangroves, is being, coral reefs and mangroves have been proven to be a good barrier for tsunamis. Um, and the more we damage, we bleach our uh, the, uh, the coral reefs, the more the islands are in danger. In danger. Um, we use our locations to increase uh, tourism, you know, ecotourism. Uh, we have, you know, these are all these island states are usually tourist attraction and, and, and millions of people go to this, this island. But how can we make that type of tourism more responsible? What is, what is the meaning of ecotourism? How can the private sector again go and look at it as a very good uh, uh, role that they can play to support the concept of um, ecotourism? Uh, whether it's in, in helping build the hotels or the facilities or taking care of these. These are good investment uh, platforms. We have seen recently the concept of uh, blue bonds, uh, as we have seen green bonds as well coming up uh, a lot, uh, targeting the clean energy. Blue bonds have come up. Um, uh, entities are looking at what is their responsibility to the society, so they have CSR investment as well. 
And another area that I always encourage a lot is the impact and effectiveness of public-private partnership. The day that we all succeed in building this kind of effective partnership to benefit the society, that is when we will be really opening the doors of circular uh, economy. And these are very important issues. So if we look at, for example, at the moment in the UAE, there's a lot of work going on, a lot of discussion of how do we deal with our plastic waste, whether it's from the retailers or it's from the suppliers or it's from the government institutions. If we succeed in really building this kind of strong uh, economic partnership that we close the loop, whatever we consume, but whom, who is missing from this equation? It's the society at large. If the society at large is really brought on board and understands its role that, yes, I have bought this material and I've consumed it, I have empty bottles, I have empty containers, my role does not finish with me dumping it in the, in the um, bin. Actually, I have to do something about it. That extra step taken by the society will only happen if the society is well educated, if we raise the level of awareness, if there is a good effort, concerted effort by all the players to ensure that we act responsibly, then that waste will not end up in the waterways, that waste will not end up into landfills, that will be taken as a raw material, pumped back into the economy. We do have facilities, factories in the country that recycle plastic, produce plastic again. And then that is where we are closing the loop. We are becoming more cost effective. Our waste is not entering into the wrong places, is nicely uh, coming back into the economy. And you are conserving resources, you are doing more with less, and you are helping everybody and everything. And this is how we are supporting then sustainable development goal number 14, uh, and we are looking at others as well, number five, number six, number seven, about removing, uh, elevating, um, uh, reducing uh, or eliminating actually poverty, hunger, uh, look at issues of gender equality through the creation of jobs and opportunities, and the list goes on. So how do we get to restore the health of the oceans and the productivity of the ocean. It can be a very, very costly exercise if we do not take the preventive measures in the beginning to do that. And that is important. I remember once I read a research that many of the rivers have become lifeless. They've just uh, a body of water that has got no productivity, does not add any value because of the acidification of these waterways. And that is very important for us to understand and to really look at uh, how do we tackle it. So when you look at issues and the challenges that are facing, you have climate change, you have melting ice caps, you have uh, the garbage uh, patches or the, uh, the plastic islands, and they are not even one of them now, you know, they are five of them um, floating around the world. We talk about it, but when it comes to action, Still, there's very little action that has been taken. I always tell every individual, and I like to take it to the individual level, do not underestimate the role that you can play as an individual. And that is what is required of each and every one of us. Let us do our role to the full. If each and every one of us did our role and took our responsibility seriously, we are literally connecting between the dots and we will be able to solve many of the problems before it becomes a problem, and then it requires a lot of more effort and investment uh, to do that. As I mentioned, there are five, unfortunately, uh, major plastic accumulation zones in the world, and the one that is in the Pacific is supposed to be the highest, and research says that it is more than double the size of France as a country. So you can imagine um, how it is uh, it becomes like a dark umbrella preventing sunlight and sun rays from entering the water. And that is when you kill all sorts of, of life in this and you create the pollution and the connectivity and the vicious cycle continues. Again, I think this is a very important slide, you know, uh, to look into and to understand uh, the size of the uh, problem.
I wanted to talk about microplastic, although I mentioned it, but I would like to talk about it, you know, especially with healthcare products. You know, we buy these body scrubs, we buy these uh, makeup, you know, we buy a lot of these things. All of these contain a very dangerous item, which is these uh, microplastics. And these get washed, you know, through the um, sewage system and enter into our waterways. So if we do not have proper um, uh, guidelines, uh, the private sector does not take its responsibility to ensure that it conforms to the requirements, regulations, and laws, commits to remove these items from their products, then yes, we are talking about something. But as I mentioned, if, if we are not doing it, then it enters into our waterways, but it comes back on our plates uh, as well. Um, according to United International Union for Conservation of, of Nature, it says that 14 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean every year. And the good thing I wanted to say here is in the UAE, we do have factories that recycle plastic. And they come to me to say that they are not getting enough waste, plastic waste to enable them to enable them to run their factories profitably, to expand their production, to open markets. But UAE is one of the big markets of, uh, of uh, products, it's a regional market, so the amount of plastic consumed in the UAE runs in millions of tons as well. We need to, to do something, and I hope through this platform and I hope through people that are listening, we'll take that extra step and segregate their plastic waste and ensure that it ends up in the factories and not in the landfills. We collect plastics and we have managed to collect, alhamdulillah, since we started this program in 20, 2005, millions of kgs of uh, plastics and we have beautiful programs and competition that we have opened up to the different sectors of the society so that they can be active members uh, in, in finding solution and be in being the solution of these uh, problems. Our slogan for Emirates Environmental Group since we started in 1992 is together for a better environment. So that importance of uh, partnership is very, very important on all levels. One of the bodies that United Nations has launched uh, uh, in 2012 is the Global Partnership on Marine, Marine Litter. This is a multi-stakeholder platform. It has got governments in there. It has got international organization. It has got NGOs. We are members of uh, GPML, and that's why you see all our work on, on uh, tackling the issue of plastic pollution is, is focused so that we can be part of the global um, movement and we can address this issue of marine litter and we ensure that our water, we drink from the sea, you know, so we don't only eat in the GCC countries, we drink um, from the sea. So it's our livelihood, our survival. Um, it's important that we protect it as well. And when you work with this kind of multinational uh, organization in this kind of global platforms, there's a lot of encouragement and coordination to build this co collaboration and, and coordination so that we share the best practices, we share knowledge. The findings of each country is put on the table um, so that you know you have a good uh, uh, solution uh, to suggest to this and, and to add to the efforts that are being conducted. Um, there was a report by United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Asia Pacific particularly. They say that during the pandemic and because of the close down and because of the restriction of movement, actually the marine life breathed, breathed a sigh of relief. They, it was a healthy period uh, for marine life. And they saw a positivity uh, in, in, um, in recovery as well. We need, I, I continue to say, we need to have this kind of regional co you know, cooperation for us, particularly in the GCC. We need to have, um, I, I would like to see regular uh, by, by annually, you know, meetings between the relevant uh, bodies and not only government bodies. The private sector is important. The people in the packaging industry to be on board, NGOs to be on board, academia to be on board, so that we are really discussing the issues from all its angles and we are working together to find uh, the solutions. 
for the UAE government, mashallah, yani since the sustainable development goals were rolled out, has been very proactive and the sustainability is part of and parcel of the strategy. So they joined the a UK initiative, which is called Global Ocean Alliance. These are countries that have come voluntarily together to work together to find how can they uh, come up with ways to protect and improve livelihoods of coastal communities as well. And this is part of the message that do not leave anyone behind. And if we are saying, you know, um, uh, we want an inclusive, inclusive recovery, it means that we should look at equity. Um, they shouldn't be a part of the world that has everything and the other part is at the receiving end. And UAE is the first Middle East country to endorse the, the target of safe guarding 30% of its ocean by uh, 2030. I think this is a, a proud moment and this is work that needs the support of everyone, of, deserves the support of every one of us actually. In addition to decade of uh, action, it's called the decade of ocean science. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have much knowledge. We don't have, uh, there's not much research and science going on to enable us to really understand this vast uh, body and vast surface, surface that it covers more than 70% of the planet. And uh, what are the, the challenges, what kind of knowledge that we need uh, to build? And I remember, you know, when we were studying and teenagers, you would find uh, in the newspapers, uh, uh, Sheikh Zaid, uh, bless his soul, used to issue um, uh, laws um, banning the fishing of particularly fish during uh, different parts of the of the year, different seasons of the year. And that was just to encourage the breeding and the increase of healthy growth of our marine life. These kind of issues that need to continue and we need to bring it to the forefront. We need to refuse it when we go to the restaurants, uh, particularly during the season that we know it is not for Hamur or it's not for all our local uh, marine life. We should know what is the life cycle and we should refuse to be served in our restaurant. When the consumer refuses, the supplier will not be benefiting, so he will not bring it. And that is how we protect. So this is again where us as individuals have a big impact through our pockets, through our actions to ensure that the right thing is done. Overfishing, and you know, you, we have international waters, some unscrupulous uh, players, you know, come to these international waters and fish, you know, because it needs really proper uh, monitoring, uh, concerted effort between different countries so that we can stop uh, this kind of overfishing in the wrong waters that do not even belong to them. Uh, so we need to have this kind of alliances between the coastal guards in, in the region to protect our uh, marine life and to protect our ecosystems as well. So the 2021 to 2030, there's a lot of expectation from all of us, from everyone around the globe. And one of the areas that is requiring action is for us to focus on our marine life as well to achieve together the sustainable development uh, goals. And to conclude my uh, presentation, to change our patterns. Change is always difficult. There will always be, there will always be resistance. Um, there will be challenges in front of us to, to change. It, re it requires determination perseverance, concerted effort, continuity. This is not a seasonal thing. It's not something I can do it today. And because there's World Water Day or World Ocean Day, and then the rest of the year, I behave uh, differently and it is business as usual. It is a lifestyle change that I, it's a commitment on the personal level, um, the institutional level that we all need as responsible citizen on this planet to ensure that we are doing it um, to protect uh, our lands, to protect our seas, to protect the air, and to ensure that we are living ourselves a healthy life and we are leaving behind a beautiful planet for our future generations. I would like to conclude uh, with uh, the quote from uh, the secret, former Secretary General of UN, um, Ban Ki-moon, of which I had the honor to sit with him many times 
um, in the global in the meetings of um, the UN Global Compact when I was a board member there. Um, and, and issues of sustainability were always very important issues. And regardless of whatever we're discussing, he will always bring these issues to the forefront. And he used to say that we are using resources if, as if we had two planets, not one. But unfortunately, there can be no plan B because there is no planet B. And it's absolutely true. This is the simple fact that we do not have another place that we can, okay, we are tired, this place is damaged, we will go to another place. This is the only planet that God has given us and put us as human species on here. And he has told us, you are the custodians of this planet. And on the day of the judgment, you will be held accountable for your actions when you are part of this whole ecosystem. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Habiba, for your valuable words and your insight uh, today. Uh, it is really um, shocking to hear, like we know as a human, we, we are not doing our, our best to preserve water, but it is really shocking to hear the impact of our behavior and how it's uh, uh, in fact, um, like uh, having a huge impact on the future of our lives. Uh, and uh, on the on the sea, on the ocean, on the blue economy. So uh, everyone who is watching us uh, or joining us online can uh, press the uh, click uh, the link down uh, below the screen if you want to ask Dr. Habiba any questions. We already have uh, a couple of those questions, Dr. Habiba, for you. The first question from our audience uh, is: How can coexistence and uh, Harmony be preserved in light of the crisis that world knows today. There are many, many crises going on around the world. So, uh, you know, um, environmental, economic, humanitarian, political. Um, as human beings, God has given us a beautiful uh, brain, and that is one of the miracles of Allah. And we have common sense, we have a knowledge. And uh, to build on using all these tools that we have at our disposal to ensure that we, uh, we are taking the right information and we are building on that information and we are acting accordingly. Uh, nobody uh, can say, I did not know throwing a plastic bottle in an ocean is a wrong thing to do. Nobody can deny to say, okay, while I am walking on the streets and I am chewing a gum and I spit it out is, is not the wrong thing to do. You know, we know it. Knowing that you are not doing something correct and then acting on that, that is where we make a difference. When we go to the, um, to the picnic, the weather is beautiful. People go picnicking in many of our open areas, whether these are on the sides of the beaches or it is in the sands or you know, in the desert or it is in the mountainous areas. Why do they, many of them, and I'm not talking about a small percentage, I'm talking about many members of the society, that when they go, they will take with them everything that they need for the picnic. When they finish picnicking, they will leave everything there as if somebody is coming to clean after them. They will go back to their cars without feeling a twinge of uh, um, you know, a responsibility of, or guiltiness that I have done something wrong. And we see that on a daily basis when we are doing cleanup campaigns and we are doing these kinds of events. That's why we roll out all the time programs, action programs, uh, beautiful competitions. Uh, the whole purpose of it is to sensitize the society, to try to make these daily habits of the members of the community to ensure that we are getting them on board to do the right thing. Yes, true. Thank you, Dr. Habiba. The second question we have is, what is the role of technology in coexistence and harmony in the marine space? Indeed, indeed. You know, technology today is a part and parcel, is the glue that connects everything together. Um, you know, the information that used to take one year to prepare today, alhamdulillah, because of modern technology, because of the accessibility to the a big data that we have knowledge sharing from different countries, we are able to come up to find the problems, to map the issues, and that is all because of technology. There's so much innovation coming up. We need to utilize this. You have, as you mentioned, um, Sally, you know, the robotics and all these kind of things. Human beings cannot go 
to the depth depth of our oceans because of the pressure and we know that if they reach to a certain level it becomes dangerous to the health and all that today you have robots that you can send them to the deepest uh, parts of the oceans and to get uh, all the data that you want you have uh, uh, measurement tools you have uh, different types of uh, cameras that can go and give us uh, a glimpse of the wonders of the underwater world True. So uh, maybe soon we will see robots doing uh, these uh, ocean missions, no? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is important. And I think this is something that through the robots, you can attract the attention of the youth because they are always intrigued. They want to know what robots can do and how. So this is one way of engaging the youth to be part of these processes, to develop robots themselves. Why shouldn't this become part of the curriculum in the university to develop this kind of uh, technologies so that they feel responsible, they take ownership of these issues, and they look for solutions to solve the challenges that we are facing. That's an excellent point, Dr. Habiba. Why shouldn't be curriculums uh, in universities to, to address this uh, and uh, solve this problem? Yesterday in the international conference that we had at Expo was sustainable urban development. And we were talking about the built environment. So I was so happy to hear our universities here in the UAE, for example, RIT, Rochester Institute of uh, Technology, the Dubai campus, they are developing today um, a building material that is not concrete, that is not cement. They are looking at alternative material to use to build, which will be lighter, which will conserve resources, which, which will have less impact on the environment, on CO2 emission, and the list goes on. So if we are focusing on the built environment, I really think equally important is to focus as well on our marine environment. Again, I will say we are coastal areas. So we are more vulnerable than other uh, countries. We need to be on top of it. We need to protect uh, ourselves by understanding what are the threats that are out there. True, true, Dr. Habiba. We have another good question. Uh, we cannot rely on uh, awareness. What is the role of governments in their researching and investing machines to sterilize and purify water before it uh, reaches the oceans and seas? Thank you very much. That is a very, very good uh, question. I agree with you 100%. That's why I said. Uh, it's not a role of one sector and one entity other than it's the role of collective. We need to have the right types of laws in place, not only having laws, the actual uh, methodology of implementation, monitoring to ensure that entities are following up to stop the gaps that are there and the loopholes that are there and to stop the unscrupulous act of some players of discharging their waste into the waterways without first treating it. And that is a very important issue. And that is a, a sin actually for, to humanity when, you, when companies or businesses, you know, just discharge um, their waste into the uh, waterways without treating them because you are not affecting one small, you are affecting a huge and it's endless and limitless because they, 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 you know, the effect goes miles and miles uh, into other parts of the of the world. So yes, we need. I always say, knowledge without action is rubbish. You know, you need to turn that knowledge that you have into action. True, uh, Dr. Habiba. More than once, you have mentioned uh, ocean acidity. Like it's a bit, it's a big, big problem. Could you walk us through that? Yes. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, everything on the planet is gases, okay? So we have a combination of gases to ensure that this is how Allah has created the planet. Different measurement of different creates different things. So the same thing, water is H2O. Okay? There are gases that have come together. When one component is more than the other, then that is when it loses its characteristic and it changes and it becomes uh, acidic. Um, so it cannot, um, uh, as you say, support life under the, the water. And that happens when there's a lot of raw discharge, chemicals, 
um, prevention of sun rays from entering uh, the seas, that is when then it turns into a very unhealthy uh, place. Okay, and it does not support life and uh, species start dying. And that is how you have a lot of extinction of a species. What if this problem uh, wasn't addressed soon enough? What can happen? Like all the other challenges, why, what will happen if we don't stop uh, cutting off uh, trees uh, and the forests? You know, God has created forests in different parts of the world, really as lungs for the planet. For every, you know, the, the land size is, is much less than the ocean size. 70% of the planet is ocean. So in that 30%, which is the dry area, there are quite a few forests. Yeah, and we know uh, the rainforest, the tropical forest, and all that. And they are there as lungs, again, to protect us human beings and, and protect life in all its forms. So when we keep on cutting it recklessly, irresponsibly, just because of economic greed for a few you know, sharks, why is that different? Then the same, and then in uh, in uh, in the oceans as well. So it's all the same thing, you know. Anything that you are doing which is irresponsibly and you don't follow the laws, and we don't have sometimes the right laws to prevent these wrong actions, it comes back to hit us in the face as human species. Yes, true, one hundred percent. We have a beautiful engagement today from the audience with us uh, joining us uh, virtually. We have another question for you, Dr. Habiba. In your opinion, uh, what we have to do in order to develop a sustainable global waste management system? Uh, <laughs> that is the that is the point that is very close to to my heart. And I said, we do have the technologies. We do have the solutions. It's a much educated planet than what it was before. We need actions. We need concerted effort. We need participatory processes. You cannot uh, roll out um, a solution without engaging, you know? Even if a solution is is a good solution. If there was no participatory process that the different sectors of the society were not engaged in the discussion process, we call it public consultation process. When it is rolled out, there will be always resistance and none follow up. But when you engage everyone and every sector in that process, then you are giving them ownership. So when that law is rolled out, there will be a lot of buy-in. Everybody will comply easily, okay? And we will be able to deal with. The problem of waste is everywhere, but the solutions are different. And today with modern technology again, and the internet at our disposal, we can find the different solutions that are out there, pull what is best that suits us. There will not be one size that fits all. For example, Sweden has looked at their waste and looked at it as a source of energy. So they have created these uh, strong platforms whereby they burn their waste and they turn it into electricity to serve all the houses. They finished all their waste, so they don't have waste and it is not even enough to give them the quality of, of the comfort that they are used to with all their facilities. So they buy the waste from other neighboring countries. So you have seen how this solution has not only benefited them as a country, benefited neighboring countries as well. That is one way of dealing with it. For me, recycling is a very important methodology and I have been focusing on it from 1997 to say that this is the best solution that is at our disposal at this stage. I'm not saying this is the only solution, I'm saying this is the most practical and best solution that we have at the moment. If we encourage and we get the buy-in from the society, then yes, we are taking the waste, but we are not looking at it as waste, we are looking at it as raw material, and we are pumping it back into the production and we are closing the loop. So thereby, we are making more with less, we are conserving water, we are conserving energy, we are reducing CO2 emissions, we are having a thriving 
secondary economy based on waste as raw material, that is one solution, that is one way of dealing with it. We see in different uh, countries, the, the focus is again on conservation of, of resources. That is a very important issue and that is an ongoing issue. Again, it is one of the areas that we focus on. How do we raise awareness to change our behavior, to change our consumption patterns? You have a strong sustainable development goals, which is called goal number 12, sustainable consumption and production. What do we mean by that? We mean by it reduce, then find ways of redu reusing it, and then recycling it. So the recycling is the last part of it. But the reduction of consumption is something that each and every one of us can do it. I always emphasize when we have an event um, dealing with the hotels to tell them exactly how many people, because I know hotels, how they cook more than the number of people. So to ensure that there is not more food than what you need, you always deal with them with that particular way to ensure that you are given enough food and not more food that will be wasted. If there is any leftover food, we take it. If the hotel refuses, we do not go, we do not continue the, the, the contract with them. Unless the hotel agrees with us to give us back the food that is left. We take that food and we distribute it amongst our, our team, our helpers and everybody. So not even one grain of rice is wasted. We deal, we avoid to do buffets. Even if we are doing buffets, then if there are not hundred types of food. So you are very particular of what you are choosing, how you are choosing the healthy options to put it for, for people. In the end of the day, really your stomach is the size of this, your fist, you know, how, how much can you put? This habit of seeing people overfilling their plates is, it should not be encouraged, should be frowned upon. And this should be something that we continue really um, uh, educating our students and our children in schools, in homes and everywhere so that they put what they want only on their plates. If they want more, there is more, but they should not overfill their plates and then half of it is thrown in the garbage. That is very important. So what I'm saying here is we need to change our attitudes. We need to change our behavior. We need to change our pur purchasing patterns. We need to ensure that we are genuine in our efforts. We do not need to buy over buying. That is again, very important. And there are tips of putting a list before you go to the supermarket so that you don't waste time and you do not buy things you don't want or you do not need. So the best thing is you have your list. Take your list, I promise you, you'll save time, you'll save money and you will save resources. Your fridge will not be overstaffed and then half of it is thrown by your domestic help. These are some of the simple um, tips that I always give, <laughs> I would like people to follow it. It really helps a lot. Thank you, Dr. Habiba, for your valuable time. It was an amazing session, to be honest. Uh, with this uh, Q&A, we close our virtual event today. It was uh, important to address those issues. Thank you, Dr. Habiba, for sharing the valuable information. And thank you for those who attended with us uh, virtually. Also, a special thanks goes to uh, the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Knowledge Foundation in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program for this incredible summit. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.